Well, you know, as we come to uh, this day, uh, although it is Labor Day weekend and we know many are traveling, many are on vacation, many are taking maybe one last break before uh, fall begins, if fall will ever actually begin, uh, I want to invite you to reach and grab your copy of God's Word and open it up uh, to Nehemiah. And we start today a brand new series, and the series is entitled uh, Rebuilding a Life That Matters. And as we were praying and reflecting all the way through the summer on, on what we would talk about and what we would share uh, for our fall spiritual growth campaign, which is somewhat uh, common for us as a church, is that we always want to give our people an opportunity as we come out of Labor Day uh, through September and October to make some commitments to grow themselves spiritually. And so we are going to start today uh, what we refer to here at Cottonwood Creek, a spiritual growth campaign. And uh, here's what we know. Uh, when we make commitments, they define who we become. And see, we also know this, that you and I will either live our life by default or design. I'm going to say that again. We will either live our lives by default or design. Default means I'm just going to uh, slip back into the old patterns, the old way of living, the old way of thinking, the old way of uh, communicating with others. And uh, here is a reality. That is a commitment. That is a commitment. And here's what we also know when we think today about making commitments that really matter. Uh, the commitments that we made in the past define who we are today. How many of you understand that? Uh, the way you are and the way I am today did not happen by accident. I may not have thought them out, uh, planned it out well. I may not have thought it out well, but I am who I am today because of the commitments I've made in the past. Let me tell you, uh, uh, I am who I am today because of the commitments I've made in the past to read God's Word, to study God's Word, to grow in the knowledge of God's Word. Uh, I am defined not only uh, by uh, the commitments I've made to God's Word, but also to God's people. The relationships I've made, the, the worshiping in the house of God, those commitments that I've made in the past have made me the person I am today, whether I like them or not. Uh, the friends that you have and the relationships that you have, you have the friends and the relationships you have today because of commitments you made in the past. You are as far along spiritually today as you are based on the commitments you made in the past. Financially, when you take a step back and think of your uh, life financially, if, if, you are, uh, if you're doing really well financially, it is because you've made some good commitments financially. You've, you've managed your money well. If you find yourself, found yourself uh, uh, at this moment overwhelmed with debt, it's because you've made some commitments in the past that define who you are. So the commitments I've made in the past define who I am today. But the commitments I make today define who I will be tomorrow. How many of you understand that? So if you don't like who you are today, here's good news. You don't have to stay that way. If you don't like the friends that you have, if you don't like uh, the spiritual growth you've achieved, if you don't like uh, financially where you are in your life, if you don't like those things, that's the beauty of God's grace and God's love with God's people is that you and I can make new commitments today to become who God wants us to be. Now, that is living by design and not default. That is living according to the way that God has created us. And so when we think about a series entitled Rebuilding a Life That Matters, man, we look around our country and we need to rebuild, right? How many of you understand that? Boy, our structures are struggling. Our, our, our people are hurting. Uh, our economy is, uh, is limping along. Health-wise, we are in a space, in a place where no one knows, are we, are we coming out of COVID? Are we going back into COVID? What do we do? There has been a, uh, a number of articles released r lately about the fact that Americans are experiencing what is referred to as decision fatigue. 
How many of you have heard that phrase? Decision fatigue, that we have to make decisions. Am I sending my kids back to school? Am I not sending my kids back to school? Uh, uh, do I wear a mask? Do I not wear a mask? Do I go out to eat? Do I not go to eat? Do I go to church in person or do I just watch it online? Uh, do I go back to the office or can I work from home? We are experiencing decision fatigue. We are all also uh, kind of wondering, all right, uh, when the shot's available, that we can all develop the antibodies we want to COVID. Is it going to be safe? Is it not? Am I going to take it or am I not? We are experiencing, they say, what is referred to as decision fatigue. Let me just encourage you with this. Very few times in life, very few times in life, can you make a decision and can I make a decision that has a guaranteed payoff? But there is one time in life when you and I make a commitment to God and commitment to grow in faith and commitment to worship with God's people and commitment to get in God's group and commitment to read God's word and commitment to pray, there is a payoff. And so that's why today we want to talk to you about commitments that really matter. And the whole uh, phraseology is rebuilding a life that matters. When I think about where we are as a country today, we couldn't help but go to Nehemiah. In Nehemiah's day, the Babylonians, you'll remember the Babylonians came in and destroyed the temple and destroyed Jerusalem. They tore the walls down. They burned the walls down. And then about 100 years later, later Nehemiah is off in a distant country. He was one of those who their parents and grandparents were drawn away. And Nehemiah has, uh, is in a place that it doesn't see like, seem like he could be much help. But we will see today just a few elements of what Nehemiah did to help him rebuild the walls and get God's people where they need to be. So as we step back, as we open up this series today, let me give you a couple of quick thoughts, all right? If you and I are going to rebuild the walls of our own life personally, the first thing we have to do, write this down, open it up in your app, we have to identify the problem. We have to identify the problem, or in your case, and in my case, identify the problems, period. How many of you have more than one problem today? I've got more. How many of you online have more than one problem today? I certainly do. And the best thing we can do if we are going to rebuild lives that matter is identify the problem. If it's finance, if it's friends, if it's spiritual growth or lack of spiritual growth, man, identify the problem. Now, for Nehemiah, as he was off in a distant land, the problem was identified easily that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down. Let's go back and look at what it says in Nehemiah chapter 1, early in the book. Here it is. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3. He says, They said to me, this is Nehemiah ga gathered words from his brother and friends, that uh, the walls of Jerusalem were down. Here's what he said. Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and in great disgrace. That's the problem. He has, he has identified the problem. Here it is. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Let me tell you what. That was a problem. How many of you understood, especially in those days, when the walls are burned down and the gates are open, the enemy, about the time, you, uh, you can gain something, you can garner something, you can grow something, you can earn something. The enemy could just roll in and take it back from you. And that's the way it is for us today. Let me ask you a question. Just identify your problems. Where are your walls broken down? Is your connection with your mate uh, not where it needs to be? Is your walk with your children and faith and uh, others uh, in the body of believers, is that a struggle? Is maybe your job's a struggle right now? Identify the problem. Now, here's the second thing. If we're going to ultimately rebuild a life that matters is we have to pray specific prayers, all right? pray specific prayers. I think a lot of times, too often, uh, we pray general prayers. We don't pray specific prayers. And, and I want you to know there is also nothing wrong when you pray specific prayers to actually pray for success. There are times that we think, well, should I pray that God would do this or not do that? Man, I want you to know if we look at Nehemiah, he not only prayed a specific prayer, he prayed for success. Notice what he says in verse 11. He says, Lord, 
Let your ear be attentive to the prayer your servant, this is Nehemiah, your servant uh, is about to pray, and the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Now notice what he says, give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence uh, of this man, talking about the king, for I was the cupbearer of the king. Now, we're going to talk more about this next week. We're going to give you more context. But notice what he did. He identified the problem, and he prayed a specific prayer. God, give me success today. And my invitation to you, whether you're online today, whether you're in the service today, I want to encourage you, pray quickly, God, let me grow more in the next six or seven weeks spiritually than I've grown in a long, long time. So first of all, identify the problems. Second, pray specific prayers and pray that God would help you succeed. Here's number three. If you and I are going to ultimately uh, rebuild a life that matters, we have to seek the answer. We have to seek the answer. And how do we seek the answer? By making commitments that matter. That make commitments that matter. As we think about the answer, what does it mean? God, what do you want me to do? Notice what Nehemiah said in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4. It says, the king said to me, what is it that you want? So Nehemiah has prayed for success. He's walking into the king. He's the cupbearer of the king. By the way, that is a pretty exalted position. That is a high position. He gets to hang out and talk with the king. Uh, we'll talk about that more later next week. Uh, notice what he says. And he goes, um, what is it that you want? And the king says, then I prayed to the God of heaven. One last quick prayer. Just one of those throw up. Lord, Lord, let me survive this. And I answered the king. If it pleases the king... And if your servant has found favor in your sight, let him send me to the city of Judah where my ancestors, listen to this, are buried so that I can rebuild it. What is the it? The it is the wall. So Nehemiah goes in to the king and he seeks a specific answer. He says, will you let me rebuild the walls? So here it is for you and me. We, we have to identify the problems. We have to pray for success, and then we have to get specific about what God wants us to do. And that's where commitments that matter really matter. And we have a lot of great uh, men and women on staff, but uh, one of the ones who is uh, one of the most committed guys I know on our staff is Chase Durham, our student minister. If you didn't know much about Chase Durham, he, uh, uh, he played college baseball, and now he continues to compete in weightlifting, uh, in, in weightlifting uh, tournaments. Uh, let, me, let me give you a video uh, of Chase. If you didn't know much about who your student pastor was, let's look at this video real quick. This is Chase. Boy, I love y'all. Give Chase a hand. All right, Chase. That looked like about 50 pounds. What was that? That was 365 pounds. Above your head. Above my head. That's what I curl with. <laughs> so, does it take commitment to do that? Just a little bit. Yeah. Just yeah. You know, I, I want to tell y'all as as he talks to us about the reason commitments are so important. I always know where Chase is when you talk about commitment. Not only does you train a lot to get to be that place and 365 pounds, but I always know where he is in his training process <laughs> by what he eats when he comes to senior staff. Because there are times that he's in that bulk phase, and man, he is just eating what the rest of us eat. He's got Krispy Kreme donuts he's throwing in his mouth. And then there are other times that he's leaning down to get into his weight class, and I'm looking over going, that's styrofoam and meat again. <laughs> so, but how many of you know that takes commitment? But let me tell you what, if you didn't know who your student pastor was, man, that is Chase. He is a guy that lives and understands the importance of commitment. So share with us today how important yeah. commitments are, Chase. Well, thanks, John Mark. That's real humbling uh, that you would say that. And, and he's exactly right. You can tell I'm in my puffy stage right now. I'm bulking up right now. But anyways, instead of just telling you guys about commitment, I actually want you guys to participate in something. I need everyone to stand on your feet. I'm serious. Stand on your feet. I'm the youth pastor. You can expect something wild and different out of me. 
Now, if health is making you stay seated, that's totally okay. But if you are able, please stand on your feet. And so here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, I am going to train each and every one of you about how to dunk a basketball. Now, I did not have anyone sign waivers, so please do not hurt yourself. If you're holding coffee, set it down. Do not tackle anyone. Do not hit your knees on the seat back in front of you. Well, all we're going to do, we're just going to do a little hop, okay? So everyone got the plan? If you're online, get off your couch, people. Join us, all right? So on the count of three, we're all just going to get a little hop. We ready? One, two, three, hop. Awesome. Congratulations. Y'all have a seat. You won't believe it, but the next time you come back to church next Sunday, you are all going to be able to dunk a basketball. That's all that it took. Now, as, as silly as an illustration as that was, it helps us visualize the importance of having a daily commitment. And yet so many times we think we can just jump once and then all of a sudden we're going to dunk a basketball. And so this may seem silly to you, but when I think about when I was growing up aspiring to play professional baseball... I didn't just swing the bat once a week and expect to go pro. When I got finished with my baseball career and began Olympic weightlifting, I didn't just work out once a week and expect to make it to nationals. The problem with our culture that we live in today is we live in this very instantaneous culture. And one of the big culprits is, is we live in the day of Amazon same-day delivery. We can literally order something at breakfast and have it at our doorstep by the time we get home from work. Like, that is mind-blowing to me. It is sometimes faster to order something on Amazon than it is to go to Target. Like, I don't understand. But so everything, Netflix, when it comes to entertainment, the days of turning on the TV guide and watching that thing scroll through all the channels until we find something we want to watch, those days are gone. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. We get to pull up Netflix. We get to watch what we want when we want to watch it. We live in this on-demand culture, this instantaneous, this microwave culture. And so here's the problem. There's obviously a lot of perks with this on-demand culture. For example, when I forget to buy diapers and we are out of diapers. Praise God for Amazon, right? They can get them there by the doorstep. Babies only have to run around naked for a couple hours. But anyways, we live in this instantaneous culture. And so when it comes to, say, diet... Like we want to we wanna lose a couple weights. We want the magic diet pill. We want to take something that's just going to shed the weight just like that. When it comes to work and our careers, we want the secret productivity hack that's going to help us advance in our careers. When it comes to the new business that we just started, we want it to be pulling in six figures immediately after we purchased on social media this revolutionary three-step process to becoming wealthy. We see this kind of stuff everywhere. And it breeds this instantaneous mindset in us. But the problem is this instantaneous culture that we live in has begun to degrade our ability to commit. And I'm talking commit on a daily basis. And so church family, here is the secret. Commitment to accomplishing your goals, whatever it may be, it does not always look glamorous. Commitment, in fact, it looks more like being covered in sweat, having dirt on your hands, waking up early and staying up late. Commitment looks like denying yourself certain comforts or leisure activities that cause you to be lazy. Now, I'm sure all of you have dreams and goals and visions of what you want your life to look like, but what I really want to remind you of is the most important thing, the most important part of your life that you need to be committed to first and foremost is your faith in Jesus Christ. Just like John Mark said earlier, when you are committed to Christ, that is the one guarantee in life that you will gain more of Christ. If you have your own Bible, open up to ch Philippians chapter 3. If not, we'll have it on the screen for you to follow along. Philippians 3, starting in verse 8, it says this. This is the Apostle Paul writing this to the church of Philippi. And when I think of someone who is committed to Christ, to being shaped into the image of Christ, to spreading the gospel, the good news of Christ, I think of the apostle Paul. Let's read what he writes here in verse eight. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. Church family, say garbage. Garbage 
that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead, not that I've already obtained this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on, say press on, to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Church family, the Apostle Paul's goal was to know Christ more. Okay, so how is he going to accomplish this goal? How is he going to know Christ more? First, he's going to count everything that distracts him from his goal as garbage. Secondly, in order to know Christ more, Paul is going to maximize the minutes of his day so that he can gain more of God, so that he can witness more to those around him. Third, in order to accomplish his goal of knowing Christ more, Paul forgets what lies behind and strains toward what is ahead. Now, John Mark has already started talking about about this, is how our commitments begin to shape us. And so that leads me to my very first point that I want us to see in the Apostle Paul is that our commitments shape our character. My commitments shape my character. Your commitments shape your character. Paul's commitment to Christ is forming this righteousness in him. It is creating this contentment that he can have even when he is suffering. Even on the worst days of Paul's life, he has this contentment, and it's because of his commitment to Christ. Thirdly, Paul's commitment to Christ is shaping a selfless love in his heart. And so when we are committed to Christ, our character, our attitude, our thoughts, our behaviors all begin to change. The Apostle Paul writes about what some of these changes look like in Galatians chapter 5. They're known as the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit, this is Galatians 5, through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The more that we are committed to Christ, the more that we will love. The more that we are committed to Christ, the more joy that we will have. The more that we are committed to Christ, the more peace that we will walk in. But here's what I'm fearful of. Do you just open your Bible one time a week and somehow expect the fruit of the Spirit to ooze out of your life? Do you just jump one day a week and expect to be able to dunk a basketball? Do you practice hitting a baseball one day a week and expect to play professional baseball? Everyone would scoff at the athlete who says they want to go pro but only practices one day a week. We would scoff at that because we know that that won't work. We know that they are not committed enough to that sport. We know that they won't grow. And yet, it doesn't trouble us when we only open up our Bibles at church or meet with our life group when it's convenient. Church family, our commitment shapes our character Commitment is not always glamorous. When it comes to a spiritual commitment, it looks like breaking a spiritual sweat. It looks like getting dirt on your hands through serving your neighbors and your family. It looks like waking up early and staying up late so that you can sit before the Lord. It looks like denying yourself certain comforts and leisure activities because you know that they do not produce a holiness in you. And so this brings me to my second point. Our commitments are rewarded. They will be rewarded. My commitments will be rewarded. Your commitments will be rewarded. Now now think about the person that wants to lose weight. If you're committed to losing weight and you do the diet, you might not get the six-pack abs that you wanted. 
But I can guarantee that you will be more healthy than when you started. That is a reward. Your business might not be making six figures, but I guarantee you your business is more successful than it was at the beginning of your commitment. You might not be able to dunk a basketball, but at least now you can maybe touch the net. Now thinking about your faith, thinking about that typical New Year's resolution of I'm gonna read my Bible in a year. You might not have read the entire Bible in a year, but I'm willing to bet you read more this year than last year if you made that commitment. You might still worry about things, but you probably worry less because you know more that God is sovereign over every area of your life. You might still get angry, but you are able to identify your anger and to stop it. And so you see, church family, when we are committed to Christ, it doesn't just all of a sudden make us perfect, but it shapes us more into his image, and we are rewarded for that spiritual commitment. 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 8 says this. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourselves to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Church family, training for godliness adds value for all things to every area of your life. So the reward of your commitment to Christ is God himself. The reward to Paul's commitment to Christ was God himself, even when he was sitting in jail cell. The reward of our commitment is God himself. Commitment always leads to growth, and that growth is your reward. Now, we've all heard this quote, and it's a pretty, like, as you see it on the poster in a classroom or something like that, it says this. Shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. If you're aiming for something, even if you don't achieve it, you'll still be somewhere better than when you were started. It, it's so true. If you're dieting, you might not get the six-pack abs, but you're going to be healthier, right? If you aspire for a six-figure business, you might not achieve six figures, but it's going to be a stronger business. Being committed to your faith in Christ is the most rewarding thing that you can do because the more that you seek the Lord, the more love and joy and peace and patience and kindness that you are going to walk in and bear in your life. The more that you seek the Lord, the more you will understand your identity as a child of God. The more that you seek the Lord, the more that you will understand your purpose in this life. The more that you seek the Lord, the more that you will be witnessing and impacting those around you. Now, when I think about these commitments, and I think about the personal commitments, your personal commitments, they're going to impact not just you. Your personal commitments to Christ will impact your neighborhood, the workplace, your friends, and your family. And so now I want to speak briefly to the parents in this room. I don't care if you've got littles or full-grown children. I just want to speak briefly to the parents. We need to be committed to training children in the Lord. Now you got to remember, I'm, I'm the youth pastor, so I'm passionate about training and equipping your kids. Proverbs 22, 6 says this, Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Now remember, this is a proverb, it is not a promise. It does not guarantee that your child will walk in the Lord because ultimately it is the Lord is going to change your child's heart, but it is us as parents who are going to collect the firewood and the kindling and lay it around our children's hearts and pray that God would strike fire to their hearts and save them. And so if you are committed to growing in the Lord, then you will be a better parent tomorrow than you are today. You will be. Because if you're a better child of God, you'll be a better parent. If you're a better child of God, you will be a better spouse. If you're a better child of God, you will be a better employer. It will lead to value and reward in every area of your life. And so church here at Cottonwood in the children's ministry, they do an incredible job equipping you with take-home sheets and songs to continue the conversation with your kids. In the youth ministry, we send out training videos and discussion questions, and we have a parent dinner coming up. We do everything we can to equip you to make disciples in your home. And so I want to remind you of this as I'm about to leave and John Mark's going to come back up. 
If you want to grow in anything in your life, you need to be committed daily. Don't expect to dunk the basketball after jumping one time at church. Don't expect to lose 10 pounds after eating one salad. Don't expect to find peace in God when you, are re- when you read your, excuse me, don't ex- expect to find peace in God when you rarely read your Bible. Don't expect to bear the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, when you're not committed to following Jesus. So why are commitments so important? One, your commitments will shape your character. And two, your commitments will be rewarded. Y'all give Chase a hand. Good word, buddy. Good word, Chase. I may drink his water if it'll make me look like that and lift that, lift that well. But uh, So here's how I want to close today. You've heard we're starting a new spiritual growth campaign. You just heard him say uh, they will shape your character, your commitments, and they will be rewarded. So here are four commitments, all right? I want to invite everybody. Here are four commitments that we are asking everybody to make over the next six or seven weeks. Four commitments that will change your life. All right, four commitments that will change your life. Now, I know some of you, with some of these, you're going to go, well, pastor, uh, I've made some of these commitments before and I've failed. How many of you have ever made a commitment and failed? All right, then we're in the right place, right? So you say, well, should I make a commitment? How far out on the limb should I go in making these four commitments? I want to encourage you to go all the way out to the end of the limb. Why? Because, folks, that's where the fruit is. If we are going to grow significantly in the next six or seven weeks, we have to be willing to go way out on the limb, all right? Commitment number one I want you to make for the next seven weeks is this, a commitment to worship. I want to make a commitment to be in worship or watch every worship service over the next seven weeks online, all right? Make a commitment. You will either be here on Saturday night in person at Cottonwood Creek, Saturday night at 5 p.m., Sunday morning at 9 and 11, uh, 9 or 11, or you will be online watching wherever you are to make that commitment. That's number one. I want to make that commitment. I'm going to be there on worship. No, so notice, commitment to worship. If you want to, if you haven't already done this, I want to encourage everybody to text the word series to 77978. Text the word series to 77978. That's going to text you uh, uh, just the notes for the weekend. It's going to be a reminder to you. It's going to tell you what's going on. And so text the word series to uh, 77978. That's your commitment to worship. That's where we're going to find the good stuff out far on the limb. Here's commitment number two. We want everybody to work. to make. You just heard Chase say that uh, you can't jump once in church and then dunk a basketball. It's the same way with our spiritual growth. If this is the only time of the week that you and I are in God's Word, we can never grow like God wants us to grow. So we have put together a reading plan and a daily scripture plan that I want to encourage everybody to be committed to. So if you're willing to say, I will read one verse that we will send you on your phone and we will have one prayer you can pray. How many of you would say it doesn't get much easier than that, Pastor? All right. I want to encourage you to text the word 40, F-O-R-T-Y. So for 40 days, beginning next Monday, not tomorrow, beginning next Monday, when we kick this campaign off, you're going to get a daily prayer, a daily Bible verse, and a daily prayer. And you will know everybody in the congregation of believers here at Cottonwood Creek is reading that same passage of Scripture and praying that same prayer. So let me encourage you with that. That's commitment number two. Here's commitment number three. I want to encourage everybody to commit to be in a group. To get connected, not forever, not for life, just for the next seven weeks. Make a commitment to be in a group. You say, what kind of a group can I be in, Pastor? Well, we have groups that meet here on campus each and every week. We have lots of life groups for young, old, single, married. Have your kids in uh, children's ministry. Have your students in student ministry at 9 or 11. Remember, we're bringing children's ministry back at both hours next week. Commit to be in a group here on campus. We also have home groups 
You can get connected with a home group somewhere, somehow, some way. Just make a commitment for the next six or seven weeks to be with that group. Every group's going to be going through the same material. Just get in a group. Or if you don't want to come on campus or be in a home group, we have some groups that are online only. So all you have to do is text the word group or groups. It doesn't matter. Get the same response. If you're willing to get in a group for the next seven weeks, make a commitment that you text the word groups to 77978. Text the word groups, 77978. And then finally, we all know if we're going to grow, if we're going to make some sort of commitment to our health or to something, there has to be some energy, some work. How many of you know that? then I'm going to commit, I'm going to encourage everybody to commit to serve somewhere. Commit to serve somewhere for the next seven weeks, not for life, just for the se next seven weeks. We need lots of people who are willing to work in our children's ministry, to open doors, to make sure things are clean, uh, to work in our student ministry. Chase, uh, he was telling us this week, we need leaders who are willing in, the, in between the teaching just to do some Q&A with kids so they grow in their faith. We need folks to open more doors, all right? We want people to be out in the parking lot to help people park. So commit to serve somewhere. You say, how do I do that? Text the word serve to 77978. How many of you know by now that that, that, uh, that number 77978 really is important? We all know that. One of four words. Series is a commitment to worship. You also, 40 is the commitment to get a daily Bible verse and a daily prayer. Uh, number three is text the word group to 77978 to get in a home group, online group, life group here on campus, life group at home. It doesn't matter. And then finally, a place to serve. Now, I'm going to give you a fifth one. I'm going to give you a fifth one. Part of the reason why I brought, brought Chase up here is you've heard me share in a video that somebody said when we all come out of uh, COVID, we're either going to be uh, chunky, hunky, or drunky, right? Y'all know that? And how many of you know, as your pastor, I've talked a lot, a lot about us being as healthy as we can be physically. Y'all know I talk about that a lot. So you're going to be here, and ladies, we have an amazing opportunity, Natalia Milo, uh, is one of the best fitness trainers around the world. Ladies, she is going to come on our campus for you four weeks to fit here on our campus. You're going to hear more about that. You're going to be, have an opportunity to sign up to go through her class. Ladies, four weeks to fit. You will never get any better training than you will get in the next four weeks. It'll start next week, not this week. Guys, men, all right? Sean Tollison, our own Sean Tollison here. Natalia is our own, and Sean is our own as well. And Sean runs a health ministry. And on uh, Thursday mornings at 6.30 in the morning, guys, we can come together, either live or in person or Zoom, and get some of the best nutritional information we can ever imagine. All right? So that's going to be the fifth. There's nothing in the notes about it, but those two things are coming. So how many of you are willing to make commitment? to grow over the next six or seven weeks. There it is. I want to close this in prayer.